This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and today we continue in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> We're in chapter 6. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided to study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and receptive to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the most notable things about the Gospel of John is that wherever John writes in this book, He's trying to teach something new about Jesus. Uh, he takes the words, the events, the surrounding circumstances, what people say to Jesus, how Jesus responds to them, and ties them in together to reveal more about who Jesus is. We see this from the very beginning in chapter 1. One of the finest examples of that is this entire discourse, what we call the Bread of Life discourse that we've been studying the last couple of lessons. Now just to read through this <clears throat> and try to expect to find some sort of typical narrative um, is going to be a challenge because the expressions, allusions, the references back to the Old Testament, to the future, these all tie in together to teach us something else about Jesus. Now, our Lord had this recorded for a reason. We are to learn about him and how he works in the lives of his people. And what we want to do to benefit the most out of this is try to tie in these, um, I don't know how else to say it except a, a complex series of sayings and words to teach certain points. It's hard to present this. Uh, if we lived back in that day and had the background that we needed, it might be easier. But I have an idea that even as John wrote this, he knew his audience would be cr uh, challenged to grasp the things he's trying to say about Jesus. So this is not a typical story, we might say. You can read it at that level, but there's a lot more going on. So keep that in mind as it seems kind of complex as we go through it and not as simple as you might expect as just reading uh, one of the other Gospels. Well, let's... Uh, remember that we have just seen Jesus feed the 5,000 on the other side of the Lake of Galilee. The crowd continued to pursue Jesus. Uh, they enjoyed the sign miracles, the benefit of them, but they didn't understand the true purpose or accept the true purpose of these sign miracles. And the purpose of these sign miracles was to constantly point to who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah. Now, recently in our story, he, uh, Jesus has went from one side of the Gal Sea of Galilee to the other, and then back again. The people have followed him. Now they are back in their Galilean headquarters in Capernaum. Jesus spoke to them, <clears throat> revealing their wrong motives, and what they should really be seeking. Let's pick that up in verse 26. <clears throat> Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on this one, 
refers to Jesus, the Father, God, has set his seal of approval. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And let me just stop at this point. <clears throat> Here we already see terms being used at different levels. Food, works of God, and signs. And we've had to sort these out and what Jesus means and what he's trying to convey with them and what the audience is picking up on them, often getting the wrong signals. So as I've tried to sort these out for you as we go through these passages, we can see how complex it can get. And don't be discouraged by that. That's to be expected. And that just means we have to dig deeper and hold on to the things that we understand and, and build on what we know. <clears throat> Verse 30, So they said to him, Then what sign miracle will you do so that we may see and believe you? What will you do? And you see, even, even at this level, they don't quite understand what it takes to believe. Verse 31, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Let me pause again. The audience does not understand the things that Jesus is trying to teach them. The reason they don't understand is because their hearts are closed. They're not using faith. They're not believing Jesus. So we see Jesus go round after round with these people trying to convince them what they need to do. Sound familiar? Verse 33. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. So again, like the Samaritan woman, like Nicodemus, they don't get it. Now there are some lessons here for us. If we're going to speak to people about spiritual things, and I suppose a lot of you out there have a lot to say to people that would really help them. Not only do they not understand what you're saying, they don't want to understand. Some just want to get into a debate. Some would just want to argue with you about what they think God is like, <clears throat> and you know they have really no idea. But Jesus had those same experiences with people. So he tries things they're familiar with. He goes back into their history. He uses uh, real experiences like eating to try to teach them. And they're still not getting it. Jesus attempts to turn their sign-seeking and their works-oriented oriented mentality uh, towards faith in him. The crowd speaks of the manna provided from heaven in the wilderness, indicating they want Jesus to provide something like that. And he's trying to give them the path to eternal life. And they're thinking in terms of a miracle, food to eat, benefits from the miracles, and not the greater miracle standing there before them. Jesus responds and emphasizes that it was the Father who gave them manna from heaven, and now it's the Father who gives them the bread of God, the bread of life, rather, which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. But they're still thinking primarily of earthly bread in earthly terms. The crowd says, keep giving us this bread that keeps giving, again, not getting what Jesus is trying to say. Well, in verse 35, Jesus makes it clear. He gets to the point. Those 
that are going to get it are going to get it. Others are not. Chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And we're going to see in the next several verses that Jesus uses pairs of terms to communicate. Here we see him saying, he who comes to me and believes. All right? But notice the first two words, I am. Now this time we have a description that goes with that word, I am. Again, the I am is the, let me just see if we can remember this. The Greek is ego ami. Ego ami. The ego is a personal pronoun for I. The ami the first singular present active indicative that means to be or to exist. In this case, <clears throat> Jesus is using the sense of to be. Now, remember the I am. We've seen it before. I want to do it this way to distinguish it from the regular I am we have in this passage. I am, we saw this with the Samaritan woman when questioning him about being the Messiah. And then again, later when he was walking on the sea, shortly before he calmed the storm and transported them, and transported them over to the coast. And now we have I am used in a series of descriptive phrases about Jesus. That'll show different aspects of his person and mission. Here he says, I am the bread of life. Let me show you a, a list of what's coming. He will say, I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the light. I am the true vine. All these describe Christ in his words speaking about his person and mission now the focus on this passage of course is I am the bread of life by that Jesus means let me write that down <clears throat> he is the only one who can provide eternal life If these people want eternal life, it comes from Jesus. Now, throughout this passage, this uh, discourse, Jesus has been leading up to this proclamation, I am the bread of life. The bread of life, he's described as the enduring bread that gives eternal life. And now Jesus says, this bread of life is him. In the rest of this verse, he describes what needs to be done. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Let me put this in parallel so we can see it a little better. <clears throat> He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. This should remind us of the living water offered to the Samaritan woman. But there it was referring to the Spirit. Now both these verbs here, comes and believes, present participles. Comes the middle participle, subject participates in the results of the action. And then believes the present active participle. So what we have here is Jesus saying, He who comes to me, further defined by believing in him. 
So coming to Jesus is further defined by believing. As one mentally turns to Christ, comes to Christ, he believes in him. And don't miss this, faith is always involved. If someone says they've came to Christ when there was a kid when they were a kid, they should be implying that they believed in Christ. Now here, the way this is stated, the coming and the believing, both volitional choices, they require a person to act. The hunger and thirst Jesus refers to is spiritual hunger, spiritual thirst. Now the crowd recently has uh, been hungry, out of food, maybe even thirsty. I mean, after all, they've been, uh, we might say, out on the trail following Jesus. And Jesus takes these real-life experiences and turns them to spiritual lessons. We all know what it's like to be hungry and thirsty and then satisfied. Now, Jesus uses this physical experience for a spiritual experience. And this spiritual experience has to do with a satisfaction with one's spiritual life. Many describe it as being empty or having a void in one's heart until he comes to Christ. There is a fulfillment. There is a filling there that occurs when one comes to Christ. One of the first things that happens is, is that the Spirit becomes active with God in a relationship with God. He goes from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And what Jesus is saying is this fulfillment, this spiritual hunger, this spiritual thirst comes with Him. When you understand who Jesus is and what He has to offer, He's offering you Spiritual satisfaction, spiritual fulfillment, a relationship with God. This reminds us of the Sermon on the Mount, actually done earlier. John doesn't include it in his book. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Those who are truly seeking God will be spiritually satisfied. Verse 36. <clears throat> Jesus continues, But I said to you that you have seen me and still do not believe. Well, let's talk about this textual issue for a moment. This one's a little complicated. I'm going to spend a few moments on it. I do this occasionally to let you know that not only am I very well aware of them, but sometimes they are important to understand why certain things are the way they are in different translations. Notice the word me in brackets. Many of translations insert the word me. Well, what the textual critics do is that they weigh what they call the external evidence and the internal evidence. External evidence includes things like the manuscripts, families of manuscripts. What do they say? What do the better ones say? What do the older ones say? Uh, not always the older ones are the better, but what do the other ones say? Uh, what do the most consistent ones say? And they they categorize these things as uh, at different levels of, of how you evaluate the text. The internal evidence has to do with, well, the language, the context, uh, what uh, perhaps John has already written in this area or what, how does he use these terms before, and the syntax of them. It's complicated. And it is a reason, it is a science, it is, a, it is an exercise a, it's a working through these things, but uh, it does take some skill and some background to fully understand it. 
But why is me in brackets? A few, including one of the better manuscripts, Sinaiticus, leaves it out. So it just says that you have seen. But I said to you that you have seen. Uh, some manuscripts include the word for me, trying to clarify, perhaps for clarification, who Jesus is referring to or whom Jesus is referring to. But that's also an interpretation. If they inserted its interpretation, because just as recently as verse 30, Jesus talking, was talking about seeing miracles, seeing sign miracles. So what happens is, and probably what happened on some of these manuscripts when it didn't have the me in there, they would insert it thinking this is what uh, the scribe meant to put in. So you can see how it gets kind of complicated. Did they insert it? Is this what Jesus really meant? And you start weighing the evidence and trying to come up with the best possible solution. <clears throat> so, with all these things said, and without going into it into greater detail, those of you who want to, uh, it's kind of like learning a subject like archaeology. We like to hear some of the results, but as far as going through the process, it's very challenging. How to how to read the the uh, different results from archaeology, for example. With all this said, it seems to be best to go ahead and just include the me and understanding it referring to Jesus. As I weighed the evidence, I thought that my first reaction was, well, it seems like he's been talking about signs, but then as you continue the context and we're about to read it, maybe he may be making this shift over to referring to himself. Uh, after all, he just referred to himself as the bread of life. So I put it in brackets. I think some of the translations even do that, showing that uh, there's a possibility it's not there. And if I'm going to do this honestly with my audience, I have to leave it at that. Nothing like being dogmatically and being dogmatically wrong. But anyway, <clears throat> I've just seen Jesus. He calls himself the bread of life. Exactly what they need for spiritual life is they need Jesus, but they still do not believe. Look at verse 36 again. But I said to you that you have seen me and still do not believe. Let me ask you this. What else can Jesus do? He's given them the truth. He's given them sign miracles. He's went through many, uh, we might say, different ways and to, to convince them. But they still don't believe. And we go back to the basic teaching we've had way back in the basic series. There's a hardness of heart here. And even with the presence of Jesus and the words he says and the things he does and just being there, their hearts show no softening. In verse 37, Jesus goes back to the Father's role in this. All whom the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not drive away. Now here we get into one of those verses that's often taken out of context to try to demonstrate the predestination. Well, I'm not going to deny there's not some element of that here, but let's understand it more fully. So we're going through this a little bit at a time. The first phrase, all whom the Father gives me, gives present active indicative of ditto me, common word in the Greek. It means to give, to grant. 
And then it says, will come to me, future active indicative of erkomai. It means movement from one point to another, just as we use it here, go or come. Put the verse back up here. Exactly was, does what, what does Jesus mean here? All whom the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, that's the individual, I will certainly not drive away. Uh, the certainly not is from a double negative in the Greek, so we put certainly, not at all, absolutely not. Drive away is the eris active subjunctive of ekbalo. Kind of see the word ball in there, B-A-L-L. -L, to throw out, to cast out, to drive out, force to leave. That's the idea here, to drive out or drive away. So let's look at the verse again with some more understanding of it now. All whom the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not drive away. Now the way Jesus says this, using the tenses of the verbs, the Father gives before the individual comes to the Son. And we just saw in verse 35 the same verb for come further defined by believing. So that idea would be included here. The one who comes believes in the Son. Alright? So, the one who comes believes in the Son. All whom the Father gives me will come slash believe. Order of events as is presented. The Father gives. The person comes. He believes in Jesus. Jesus will not drive them away. Again, let me just put that up there. The Father gives. The person comes to and believes in Jesus. Jesus will not drive them away. Now let's make this clear. One cannot sensibly deny that belief on the part of each person is necessary. Otherwise, much of the teaching and commands of Jesus about belief in this chapter, and in fact this entire book so far, would be meaningless. Uh, and go back to as early as chapter 2, several verses, 2.22, 3.15 and 16, uh, 1836 and so on and so on state the necessity to believe in the Son for eternal life so that cannot be left out if it's not mentioned in one verse it doesn't mean it's not there because it's been previously taught over and over and over again we see this with Paul sometimes he'll teach a principle several times he'll go on to the next thing but not refer back to the same principle we should assume he still means what he meant earlier. So belief is always necessary for eternal life. Jesus has said that himself over and over again. So it's implied here, just recently was in the previous verse, back in verse 35. Let's look at uh, 629b again. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Believe, believe is in the previous two verses. So we've seen it over and over again. Now, Father gives, the person comes, he believes, and then the Son keeps him by not driving him away. 
verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Jesus makes sure his listeners understand this isn't his plan. This is the Father's plan. He's following the Father's plan. And that includes, let me just write it down so we we'll keep it in front of us. <clears throat> the Father gives. The person comes, just insert believes, and we'll say the Son does not drive away. And don't miss this phrase, does not drive away. The one who believes Jesus is going to run them off. The one who comes, Jesus is not going to run them off. He's not going to cast them out. The reasoning is the Father gave them to him. And as a person comes to Jesus, Jesus is going to take care of them, so to speak. Now, if we put these two verses together, this one and the previous one, here's what we get. Let me scroll this down just a little bit. Now, now I'm including this previous verse. Our verse right now. The Father's will. The Father's wills, the Father gives. The person comes and believes. The Son does not drive away. The Father's will for the Son is not to drive away those who the Father gives and those who come to the Son. The bigger picture is this. Now, John's not discussing the bigger picture. He's keeping it in the present without looking back to the distant past. We've done that in other books. But the Father's will for the Son is not to drive away those. All right, so we put the Son not drive away person comes believes father gives the big the bigger picture is this in eternity past that's indicated by eternity past the father knows who will respond in faith and they are given to the son so this is your foreknowledge. John doesn't mention it. Paul discusses it. And what we're doing, we're taking what we've known from other books, from other principles, and helps us fully understand what Jesus is saying. Now, they're just getting this part. That's what I meant when I said they're just getting the present, what they need to see right now. So, as the Father knows who's going to believe, he gives them. In time, the person comes and believes in the Son, and both in time and in eternity. As long as the person keeps coming and believing, Jesus keeps them. Verse 39 restates the thoughts of verse 37 and 38 and adds something else. Now, this is the will of the one who sent me. There's the will again. That out of all he has given to me, there's the giving again, I will lose none but raise. Actually, in the Greek, it's it, but that's permissible in the way the language works to refer to a uh, plural uh, as an accusative. So we could translate it them. I will, new, I will lose none but raise them up on the last day. So what have we added to our sequence? We've added, 
let's get rid of this right here. We've added resurrection. The sun will raise. sun will raise. That's in the future. Now this is the will of the one who sent me. That goes back to verse 38. That out of all he has given to me, that goes back to verse 37. I will lose none but raise them up on the last day. And that gives us verse 39. So the last three verses here, including the one we're doing, combine these thoughts. The it, by the way, I was pointing out to you what they call a collective singular. Going back to the all he has given me. So resurrection is added to the plan and to the will of God. The Father gives, uh, the person comes, the Son does not drive them away, he doesn't lose anybody, but raises them up on the last day. Now, you may recall back in verse 21, 521 actually, 521, it was mentioned that the Father also takes place in raising the dead. Well, he's the planner, he's the author of the plan, for just as the Father raises the dead and makes them alive, even so the Son also makes them alive, those he wishes. Remember, the Father is the starter, the initiator of the plan. You know, and to uh, write this out like I did here, should help us understand the overall plan of God and how a person is uh, saved and how he remains saved and the father's role, the individual's role, and the son's role. And it clarifies, at least it should, in our mind that the father is the planner. All right? I just write that up here. He is the planner. Okay? The son carries out his role in the plan, and you are very much involved and the way you act in that plan. And the wonderful thing is, is that, well, just to use our little illustration here, we're sandwiched in between God the Father and God the Son. There's your security. You have the Father acting on your behalf because you responded in faith. You are kept by your faith, by the power of God, and the Son will not drive you away. In fact, he will raise you up someday. Verse 40 sums it up for us and as the most important act that the person does within these divine acts. Let me say that again. Verse 40 sums it up for us and gives us the most important act that the person does within these divine acts. Here we, again, we see some of the same thoughts we previously saw. For this is the will of the Father, there's the will again, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him to have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Let's talk about the will of the Father for a moment. Uh, let's take some points on that. I'll put them down at the bottom. On for this is the will of the Father. One, Jesus' food is to do the will of the Father. John 4, 34. Remember that? Two, Jesus said he came down from heaven to do not his will, but of the one who sent him. And this is the will of the Father, 
of all Jesus is given, that Jesus not lose one, but raise him up. And everyone who beholds and believes, this is our verse, in the Son, have eternal life. So, when you believe in the Son, it's the Father's will that you have eternal life. It's the Father's will that Jesus not drive you away. It's the Father's will that he will raise you up someday. All in his plan. All set, by the way. And as you sit there and listen to this, if you believe in Jesus Christ, that will all be done for you. Let's go back to our verse. Verse 40, that everyone, each person, who beholds present, active, indicative. The word is... Theo reo, to view, to, comp, to contemplate. Uh, let me get the rest of this up here. View with interest, to come to a knowledge of. Now here again we see two parallels, as we saw earlier, with come and believe. Now we have the parallel of Behold the Son and believe in Him. Uh, Theoreo means to see and grasp. The idea is to see and grasp who Jesus is. So beholding, as we saw earlier with uh, coming, is further defined uh, coupled with the word believe. So again, we have the word believe here. Keeps on believing. Now, we have seen the word belief coupled with different words in John. We go back to 112. Receive and believe, see and believe, come and believe, and now behold and believe. Belief is always essential. And then our verse, we have our two results to have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Uh, do you understand how many times now we've seen life connected with belief and resurrection? Again, resurrection, being raised up in the last day is mentioned. The last day is a general reference to the resurrection that occurs at the second advent of Christ. Notice we see three persons involved. We see the Father, we see the Son, and we see the individual. It's the Father's will. The human is the one who beholds and believes and will have eternal life. And the Son is the one who will raise up on the last day. And we see this on a few occasions through this passage. The Father's active, the person believes, he beholds, he comes, he sees, he receives, and so on. And the Son raises. Receives actually back in chapter 1. But in chapter 6, the individual sees, he comes, and beholds. And he believes. Let me chart this up a little different. Well, I'm going to wait on that. I have a better place to do it than here. Uh, let's go through a few more passages first. But we see the active participation of God the Father, the individual, and God the Son in the salvation and security of the believer. The Father and Son are active in resurrection. Verse 41, we see the Jews' reaction after what Jesus has said so far. What do you expect them to do? Well, we know their attitude. Verse 41. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. The word grumbling, imperfect, active, indicative, 
indicative imperfect is continuous action in the past. We use words like was and were or kept on doing, um, were grumbling. Gongudzo to murmur disapproval. The Jewish authorities did not like what Jesus was saying about him being the bread that came down out of heaven. That didn't sit right with them at all. Uh, you could just hear them in today's terminology of all the nerve. Who, do he th who does he think he is? Verse 42. Here's the type of things they were thinking and saying. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? The reasoning is that Jesus is nobody special. They knew his parents, both earthly. How could he come down from heaven? And of course, they did not know that Joseph was not the physical father of Jesus. They were right on their mother, though. But still, they're baffled. They don't know why Jesus would say such a thing. First thing Jesus wants to do is stop them from grumbling. Verse 43. Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. If you're going to sit there and you're just going to disapprove, you're going to gripe about me, about what I say, we're not going to get anywhere here. So he commands them. That's imperative. Stop grumbling. This reminds us of the Israelites in the wilderness and their grumbling. They couldn't get anywhere with God or in their faith. It kind of put a, a stop to their faith when they grumble. It shows a lack of faith. Verse 44, Jesus continues. No one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day here we again has we have the father in action the son in action and the individual in between the word can the word frequent word in the Greek New Testament dunamai Basically, mean, dunamis means power. Dunamai, the verb, means to be able or can be capable of something. No one is capable to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Let's talk about the word draw. Uh, let me just put all this definition up here. Helco is the word to move an object from one area to another in a pulling motion. That's the basic meaning of it. Uh, Paul was dragged out of the temple, Acts 21 30, by physical force. Other occasions, not only just Paul, uh, Acts 16 19, James 2 6. It means to draw a sword, John 18 10. Haul in a fishing net, John 21 6. And it's metaphorical use here. It's an inner drawing to lead by inner force. Now, in the present description here, again, not going back to foreknowledge or the calling of God for that matter, in the order of events, the Father must first draw the person. Again, John doesn't go into the foreknowledge of God or the calling like Paul did, but stays with the more present. John wants them to understand that the Father is involved. They have to be drawn. Then they come. Now, let's put ourselves in the sandals of those listening to Jesus. They're being told that the reason they're not coming to Jesus is because the Father hasn't drawn them. Well, you think we uh, suddenly have a group of predestinarians there? 
Do you think they'd be thinking that since I'm not being drawn, I'm not going to come? But look at the rest of this uh, idea here on, in verse 44. I think that if they really wanted to know Jesus, to come to him, to believe in him, they'd be looking at this end part here about being raised in the last day. How am I going to be raised in the last day? So they would want their father to draw them. And so they go back to the individual thinking that I've got to choose to come to Christ. So when we put all these thoughts together in the last several verses, it's really much simpler than it might look when you've read this in the past, perhaps, or someone's tried to explain it without going into the background. But uh, I'm being presumptuous there, but it's not that complicated. If you want to be raised up in the last day, you need to come to Christ. John doesn't take choice out here. He just includes the Father's role. Those who are going to come to Christ are drawn by the Father. Now, to go back to our uh, time chart, we might say, we put the drawing right here. So, as these people hear this, the choice is there. A rejection of Christ would mean a rejection of God. In other words, if one chooses to reject Christ and not believe in him, then they accept the fact that they haven't been drawn. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't like that. What do you mean I haven't been drawn? Because, in the explanation of this, as we, as we know more than what John is showing us here, in the foreknowledge of the Father, and the foreknowledge of God, he knew, he knew, because he knows everything, past, present, and future, who was going to respond to the gospel and who wasn't. This is not saying that whom the Father draws, he makes believe. No. But at the same time, it includes the idea that God is involved in this. God is going to make this happen. If you are going to respond to Jesus, and he knows that from the past, he knows that from eternity past, he knows from his foreknowledge what you're going to do in the future. He will make sure that you are drawn because he knows that you're going to believe. He also knows if you're going to be faithful all your life and you're going to be raised. But this is the pattern you want. You want to be drawn. You want to come believe. And so Jesus will not drive you away and you'll be raised. It's that simple. Now, to these Jewish authorities who hear this, would they be thinking, well, I don't feel like I'm being drawn. So I'm not going to believe. Are they going to blame God for their unbelief? And one of the first things they have to do, remember we just saw this, if they're going to get any of this, they need to stop their grumbling. First thing they need to do is stop grumbling. Stop griping about Jesus. You don't like what he says. You don't like where he's from. You know something about his background. And that's a lesson for all of us. Maybe you know someone now who's in the ministry that you knew as a young person. And now it's 30 years later in the ministry. And you have a real problem with them because you knew them when they were younger. Well, they knew you when you were younger too. Remember that. 
So the first thing they have to do is stop their grumbling, and then the order of events, the Father draws. We could include today the conviction of the Spirit, and then the individual comes, believes, and the Son, and they'll be raised in the last day. So what John does, he brings in the Father's role. Or I should say Jesus brings it in. John records it for us. Make sure we understand what's going on here. Um, verse 45, Jesus starts to give some Old Testament support. Just what these old Jewish authorities needed. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learn from him comes to me. Now this adds a fascinating aspect to this. It's written in the prophets from Isaiah 54, 13a. Let's talk about the context where it says they will all be taught by God. The Old Testament context is the future millennial kingdom. The new covenant is in fruition. It's going full-blown and there it talks about being taught by God. Everyone will be taught by God in the Millennial Kingdom. The thousand years, all right, the thousand year reign of Christ. Let's just make sure we understand that when Christ reigns, all Jew and Gentile are taught. A good verse for that, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, particularly verse 34. Now Jesus quotes this line that all will be taught by God from Isaiah 54, 13, saying that there will come a time when everyone will be taught by God. Now Jesus will take this and make a current application to the people in his audience. When he says, let me just put that one line up here. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. Here we see another act of the Father. And then the person comes to the Son. Alright, so if we go back, we can add here. another act of the Father, and that's taught. But let's look at more detail in this particular verse. This tells us that those who come to Christ are taught by and learn from the Father. Now, the Father, let's just write this way, the Father teaches. They come to Christ. That's the idea here. They come to Christ. Those who come to Christ are taught by and learn from the Father. They learn from his spoken word and his written word. They hear and learn. Obedience is implied. You have to hear the gospel. You have to learn the gospel. You have to obey the gospel, which is believing. You obey by believing. So those who respond by hearing, uh, by obedience, and learning, come to the Son. That's what this is saying. Now other scriptures tell us that God reveals himself in creation, in the inner man, the uh, natural uh, moral instinct, you might say, that every person has. And man has a choice to respond to God, and as he does, the Father brings along the gospel, the person hears and learns, then the person comes to Christ by faith. Jesus makes this application for his current audience. Uh, to put it in, perhaps to paraphrase, you all have knowledge of God. You all have an opportunity 
to be taught by God. I'm telling you this with the words I speak, and you have the written word also. Now, let's chart this out from what we've seen. I've tried to do this, but it keeps making my margins mess up, but I think I've got it down here. God the Father, pertaining to, pertaining to salvation, we see the things he does. We've got some, breath, uh, uh, some verse references here. The Father's involvement, he gives them to Jesus. You see, given, he draws them to Jesus. He teaches them. This is our last verse. The person comes to the Son, beholds and believes, comes to the Son again in verse 44. He here learns and comes in verse 45. The Son's role does not drive away, does not lose. He raises up, he raises up, he raises up. See the emphasis on resurrection. Now one of the things about resurrection is resurrection's purpose is to take you into eternity. So when you hear raise up, you're thinking in terms of eternal life and eternity. Uh, you have a resurrection body. I mean, after all, your mortal body is not going to last very long in eternity. It's not designed for eternity. So, here we see a breakdown of the Father's role in salvation, the person's role, and God the Son's role. Notice the person's role. Now, remember how many times we saw the word believe? Verse 36, Jesus reveals the only way to God the Father is through him. Jesus, well, I might say here, shifts gears here and eliminates perhaps some false thinking. 646, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is sent from God. This one has seen the Father. Only Jesus has seen the Father. So this verse is telling us two things. This eliminates those who think they've seen God through some mystical experience, that they've gotten some special teaching from him directly. And the other point is that Jesus is both from God and has seen the Father. Furthermore, we've learned in John, he is the revelation of God to man. In fact, if they want to see the Father, they want to hear the Father, they need to hear and see Jesus. Furthermore, Jesus is from God. Remember, he was with God. He is God. He made the Father known, 118. So, Jesus has seen God, so they need to act. They need to act upon him by believing in him. John has established the fact early in this book that God became flesh, and they can see God only in Jesus. Now, this is lessons going long, but I want us to finish up this section. In verses 47 and 48, Jesus comes back to the central issue, to the central act that everyone must do. He's been talking about the bread of life. It brings life. Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Again, truly, truly, this is the fact of the matter. He who believes, present active indicative, keeps on believing, has, keeps on having eternal life. The present tenses. This is a central issue. This is the bottom line, as we might say. You have to keep believing to have eternal life, and you believe in Jesus. And then finally, to wrap up beautifully, 648, I am the bread of life. They must understand with all this talk about food, which endures the eternal life, that the Son of Man will give, the bread, the manna from heaven, the Father giving the true bread, 
with this long discourse on the bread of life, it comes down to understanding that Jesus is the bread of life and that by believing in him, one has eternal life. They must consume Jesus. And folks, that's always the issue. What will a person do with Christ? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for this lesson. It's been a, a marvelous but complex in many ways that we've learned about how Jesus presented himself to so many people. And we thank you that John has recorded this so that we can see the depth and the extent to which Jesus went to try to persuade people to trust in him. We ask now that we'll be challenged with these truths, that we'll learn, believe, and apply them. In Jesus' name, amen.